Hi. Today I'm joined by Will Lloyd to discuss his cover story for this week's New Statesman, all about what King Charles really believes. So, Will, your whole premise for this story is that our new king has been having an affair with another country. Yes, Charles has been having an affair with Romania um, for 30 years. So he's been doing it for a while. Um, They haven't got married yet. um, And there are no love children, as far as I can tell. He keeps going to a very specific part of Romania in southern Transylvania. He makes speeches there. Um, He opens uh, charities. He does fundraisers. Um, He receives gifts. He gives gifts. This is a jewel in Romania's crown. It may be difficult for people to see this now, but I think Romania is a a wonderful country. And I thought that one of the things that's a bit of a shame in the way we talk about Charles, and certainly the way the media have covered him for decades, is that we don't take him very seriously. And Charles is very unusual. One of the things I say in the piece is, I think the Windsors generally are pretty banal people. I don't think Charles is a banal person. I think he's a very deep and serious thinker as far as the stands of royalty go. And so I wanted to kind of explore that and investigate that. And I think Romania is the place to go um, in order to do that. And given that Romania is the place to go in order to do that, you you went there. You went to this remote part of Transylvania called Viscri. Viscri, yes. Mm -hmm. Why why is Viscri so important? Viscri is a bottled version of the High Middle Ages, or at least that's what it appears to be. So to go a little bit further back to the 12th century. We're going to do a history lesson. Let's do a history lesson. (laughs) We're going to do a history lesson. Well, tell us about Transylvania. Well, the thing is with Transylvania is um, it has for centuries been a place where armies cross into Europe. So you can see this with the Mongols. Um, I think in the 13th century, this army of horsemen, you know, tears out of the Orient. Um, starts hanging people from trees and shooting at them with bows and arrows. Um, Then you get Ottomans going through Transylvania. You get the Soviet Union going through Transylvania. And so the people who lived there developed survival instincts. They developed a certain form of architecture, which I think displays their sort of both spiritual and physical fortitude in the face of these countless invasions. I think there have been 10 foreign incursions into Transylvania. This architecture in the 1980s was threatened by Ceausescu, who had become Romania's dictator. And he was, um, he had a plan called systematization. And the point of systematization was to destroy this heritage. It wasn't just Transylvania, but it did affect these Saxon parts of Transylvania. Now, Charles, who doesn't like communists for good reasons, members of his family, the broader royal families of Europe, have been executed by the communists. It's something I write about in the piece. Um, when he finds out about this systematization plan, which I, I couldn't quite nail this down, but I think it was um, a woman called Jessica Douglas Home who involved Charles in this. He starts writing to Geoffrey Howe, who was then the foreign secretary, saying, what are we doing about systematization? Why are you letting these buildings be destroyed? Why is this happening? You know, Charles is very famous for his letter writing campaigns. Um, and he makes a speech where he says, you know, this is diabolical, this is barbaric, like this can't happen. Um, and that's where his initial interest in Romania comes from, from these Saxon buildings, which are, when you go there, um, very striking. They dominate the landscape. You'll be crossing over some hills, or you'll be walking down a path or something, and then suddenly there'll be um, a Kirkenbergen. I hope I'm saying that correctly. This is the huge sort of churches yeah. and castles that yeah. rise up out of the landscape. 12th century churches that were built sort of, you know, by hand, with lime. Um, they're astonishing monuments to... I think when in Viscri there were 50 families who moved there from, not Saxony, but they actually moved there from a, a, a river valley near um, what is today Luxembourg. And they built these by hand, 50 families. They built them quickly and they've lasted for eight centuries. And you do get a sense of people moving into an alien world. It would be the equivalent of like moving to Mars and building a colony. They were colonists in this rugged, wild, dangerous place. And these these churches do have something. There are very few places, I think, where in my life where I've gone there and thought, you know, they have that thing. It's not something that you can really put into words. I didn't try to. <laughs> but I think Charles experienced that as well. Well, we know that Charles is a keen conservationist mm-hmm. and um, very much over the, the decades that he's been in the public eye has sort of campaigned for ecological causes mm-hmm. and 
sort of protecting the the natural world. But there seems to be, from what you write, something particularly special about this place that tells us a bit more about his psychology than just he likes trees. Yeah, right. So exactly. That's, that's totally true. So for Charles, I think... I mean, tre- tre- trees, trees are great. Protecting trees We are love great. trees. We love trees. The, I, uh, the Romanian guy was showing me some apple trees there and he said, these trees can cure cancer. And I thought... Well, I hope they can. That'd be great. Can you tell the world about that? That would be, be lovely if we, could, um, if we could sort of outsource that around the place. Um, Charles has a very integrated and consistent philosophy. Because he's not a politician, he doesn't have to move with the, with the tides. He doesn't have to be a weather vane to public opinion. Charles, I th- you know, probably from the 70s, has believed exactly the same set of things. And it's an integrated view of nature. And that's not like nature, look at those leaves. It's nature with a capital N as a force in the world that is that is the world. As something spiritual. Yeah, it includes, it goes from architecture to the soul, um, from people to places. It's a fully harmonious, social, natural order. And what he found in Transylvania, what he says he found, uh, the, the, the word he uses, which is really interesting, is timelessness. And he thinks that that place has survived the ravages of what he calls always modernity. So people there live in harmony with nature. They are closer to their true selves. And what people should be doing, and this is what I think is really interesting, those Romanians, those Transylvanians, they're more real than people in Britain because we're modern. These people are in harmony with nature. We're not. And I thought that said something very interesting about what he may may think and feel about this country. You've got a quote here from um, a documentary that Charles has made called Wild Carpathia, which you say plays on a loop in the barn attic of his property in, in Viscri, where he says that this place is the last corner of Europe where you can see true sustainability and complete resilience in the maintenance of entire ecosystems for the benefit of mankind. That's that's quite a claim. That's that's this is the place to model if you want to save the world. And this was a, a, a source of mine basically explained to me that Charles believes that these places like Viscri are the only way humanity is going to make it through the sort of climate apocalypse is if we start living in the way people live in Viscri or the way Charles thinks people live in Viscri. We'll we'll come back to that yeah. that second point in a moment on the climate crisis, mm-hmm. Charles has obviously been a huge proponent of tackling climate change since before it was cool, before it was yeah. a, a, a headline political issue. So much so that he was sort of thought of as being a bit of a crank um, mm-hmm. for many, many years mm-hmm. until the rest of the world caught up. And obviously he had this moment at mm. COP26 when the, the UK hosted where he was there essentially being proved right about all of the things that he'd been warning about, sort of climate apocalypse and the rest of it. Um, but this is more than just climate change is bad and we need kind of human ingenuity to tackle it. This is about going back rather than technology taking us forward. I think Charles himself would say, he actually does say this, he says, I, I don't want to preserve things in aspic. He is in some ways forward looking. Well, he's forward-looking in the sense that he saw the climate crisis before yeah, a lot yeah. of other people did. But Charles has a Charles has a view of um, he has a view of nature and of society that I think is essentially static. He thinks that ecosystems are ecosystems and they sort of move in a circle. Whereas I did I did try and speak to some ecologists for this, and I said, "Is nature static?" And they said, "No, it's dynamic." I think that's a mistake Charles makes about ecology and the environment. Um, that this one moment where everything was in balance and you've got the trees and the wildlife and the animals and the people yeah. living in harmony, that that is a, a sort of temporary moment and things move on and he doesn't necessarily understand that. Is that the idea? I think change is constant and Charles doesn't understand that. Also, if you're a monarch, change... This is one of the things I think is interesting. We can only speculate, but if you, if you're a monarch, how much do you want things to change? A static society is quite a good thing for a monarch to preside over. And I think one of the things I wanted, really wanted to bring out in this piece is that because he had such a difficult relationship with his parents, he had to go and find other parents. And so you have the South African Lawrence van der Post, who was a, um, an author and I don't know what I can say legally. Uh, he was quite a dodgy guy, I think. 
Um, and there's some, there's some, there's a very good biography of him which sort of shows some of this. And there's also Kathleen Rain, who was a poet, quite a famous poet, but also a mystic and a believer in um, Neoplatonism and traditionalism, again, with a capital T, not a small t. And these were huge philosophical influences on Charles. And they helped him to conceive of himself as much more than the, the, the tabloid Charles, who's a fool and we laugh at and we, we sort of pity. They made him feel as if he was a heroic figure in a struggle against modernity, a struggle against all the outcomes of the Industrial Revolution, a struggle against the Enlightenment. Uh, and he could be the vessel, you know, he could be the hero who would take us back towards a more harmonious state of being where people would be, I think he would believe, much happier because they would be living in the way that you said with the bears and with trees. <laughs> I have to say there's a, there's a brilliant illustration uh, for this piece, which yes. um, is worth buying the magazine alone, I think, just for, that, just for that illustration, where Charles has the exact same expression as the bear next to him, which is quite amusing. Yeah. Um, but we've talked about this degree as a place and nature. Mm. More pertinent this week is the monarchy and the concept of what a monarchy is in, in modern times, what yes. a monarch should be, and the relationship between the monarch and the people, that relationship, that dynamic, has always been a, a slightly uncomfortable one mm. for, for Charles, hasn't it? Yes, and I kept thinking about this. Why does Charles dislike the modern world so much? Now, it isn't just about the environment and pollution. Um, there's, a, there's a thing Charles says in an interview with um, Jonathan Dimbleby in 1994, he says something like, I'm not very good at being a performing monkey. I'm not very good at being a performing monkey. And I thought, this is interesting. He understands that the way the British relate to the monarch now, the, you know, the conventional hierarchy of it, where the monarch is at the top and you have these uh, social put, orders. Put, put there by God. Put there by God. Divinely ordained hierarchy. Okay, that shifted. I think I, one of the things I argue in this piece is that shifted. And it shifted between the end of the 60s right up to the present day. And what happened was a restoration of the way the monarchy was, um, the way the monarchy was viewed in the 18th century, where it was like, look at those funny German guys in Buckingham Palace or some ugly house in London. Let's laugh at them in our club. Um, and the order got reversed. And the monarchy, the Windsors, became a form of entertainment that is put on for the people that we make jokes about. This is actually quite similar to some of the stuff that Prince Harry talks about in his memoir, Spurs. Which you wrote a wonderful review of, and I you know, went back to for this piece, and Harry compares it to insects having their wings pulled. I think, I think Spare is the most honest and unflinching and raw account. I just got, that sound a bit ridiculous here. I sound like oh, Oprah's book club, but it is an amazing- Unintentionally so, but yes. Yes, I don't think he, yes, exactly. But it's an amazing look at what we do to these people. And I say we, I mean, I'm talking about the media, I'm talking about the people who buy these papers, I'm talking about the people who watch these documentaries. I think it holds a mirror up to something incredibly cruel about Britain, that we think it's appropriate to have what I call a, a, a pedigree human breeding farm. Um, you know, Virginia Woolf once said that the mo being a royal was like being an ant struggling with a single pebble up a hill. And that was in the 30s. I don't know, in the age of endless sort of social media dissection of these people's lives, you know, journalists going, you know, hacking phones, going through people's bins. You know, what does it mean to be a royal? And I think Charles had a very negative and pessimistic conception of what it meant to be a royal. And so, what does he find in Romania? The opposite of all of this. He finds a bottled antique world where, one of the things I, lo I, I loved sort of finding out was how much people revered him. They, they, they love him there. I kept being asked, would he be our king? I thought, well, go ahead, you know, why I mean, not? He'd probably love that. I, th I think I think he'd make a fine king of Romania. Um, and Charles had, had spoken to people. He'd sent them jam. They'd whittled he, spoons for him. He tickled their cows. He tickled a cow. You know, he, 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 this was over 30 years. It was a deep and long-lasting commitment. And you also say a, a deep and long-lasting but solo commitment Yes. We we don't think that he brought Camilla there. He certainly didn't bring Diana there. Yeah, th this was him. As far as, I, as far as I was able to find out, Camilla didn't go with him. The boys didn't go with him. And so this was his bolt hole. This was his escape hatch. 
this was the ejector seat in the car which shoots up and he floats over to Romania and he got something there that he could not get from Britain. The only comparable place for him, I think, is Balmoral. And he loves Balmoral. And he, you know, in um, Jonathan Dimbleby's biography of Prince of Wales, he talks about Charles, you know, in the undergrowth as it snows and it, as it rains, sliding around in the mud on his own with a dog and a telescope, you know, just being in nature. And this is a man who has a very, very deep need to get away from things, to escape from things. And what's so interesting about this moment is, well, you, can you escape into a postage stamp? You know, can you, es can you escape onto a banknote? Can you disappear into newspaper headlines? His urge is to get away from us, from our country, from our people. Well, I was gonna say, we've been talking about monarchy like it's something terribly unfair that we do to the royal family. And mm. in many ways it is, but it is also a position of immense privilege mm. and a certain degree of unearned power. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are lots of people this week who are pointing out that perhaps we shouldn't have a monarchy mm -hmm. and having an unelected king tell us what to do, even in a symbolic sense, doesn't really make sense in 21st century Britain. It's a weird tension, isn't it, that simultaneously Charles seems to believe that he has been treated very badly by mm -hmm. the British people who have put him in that position, but also that he has some right to have his world view, his opinions on the world taken seriously by the country, by the virtue simply of who his parents were. Right, exactly. And so the rhetorical, that's totally true. So the rhetorical move he makes in his speeches, and he's been doing this for decades, is he talks as if he's a vessel of the people's unexpressed will. So in the 80s, when he makes famous speeches um, praising um, alternative medicines or uh, attacking famously carbuncle modern buildings, Charles will always say in the speech, the line is always something like, this is what, you know, this is the unexpressed view of the people. When it's almost like people have had enough of experts. It's very close to that. He wrote a book in 1988 called A Vision for Britain. And he quotes a poem um, by G.K. Chesterton, which I can't remember the title of, I apologize, but... The poem is about when will the people of England speak? They haven't spoken yet. And Charles quotes that as if... They're speaking through him. They are speaking through me. And this was something that Van der Post and Rain encouraged him, I think, to think of himself as, you know, he has a mystic intuition. Intuitive is a word that comes up a lot around Prince Charles. Intuitive. It's not a spreadsheet. It's not, it can't be measured. It can't be quantified. It's something he feels within himself that he can then um, much more accurately describe and shape reality with than ordinary people, uh, than, you know, the elites, the experts. He doesn't use that language quite, but... I mean, it's hard to think of somebody more elite than the, the literal <laughs> yeah. king of, of Britain. <laughs> yeah, but there's something downtrodden about him. When I write about people, I like looking at photos of them, and I kept looking at photos of Charles, and there is something... He, he always looks like he's about to cry, I think. Unless he's holding a pint, in which case he looks quite happy, which is also a bit of a giveaway, I think. <laughs> but um, he often looks so sad, you know? Like he's seen too much. Yeah. I want to talk about traditionalism with mm -hmm. a capital T mm -hmm. because one of the points that you make, which I think is really interesting, is that Charles does not fit neatly into a political bracket. The, the right think he's a woke leftish wants to save all the trees kind of yeah. type and you know those on the left are sort of like you are the epitome of the elite you know you're a nepo baby you're a nepo quite literally a nepo baby yeah. uh, out of touch with you know, the vast majority of ordinary people in 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 this country um it doesn't really fit into anyone's political camp i'm not sure if you had a political cause and you could say and this is supported by i was going to say prince charles but but mm. by king charles mm. that that might harm your cause as much as help it in in many ways yeah i i mean po i mean possibly um i think Char charles has done really important work um sort of beyond politics you know the prince's trust 
is actually quite a magnificent organization. It has helped thousands of people. Charles has not really received adequate praise for this, in my opinion. He, he is in some ways a great man. Um, and he has also spent, you know, the vast majority of his adult life waiting for a job and not necessarily yes. getting the credit for the work that he was doing yes. because somebody else had the top job. It's true. I put this to somebody. I put the, the question you asked earlier to somebody who, who um, has worked with him before. And I said, well, well what would Charles say if we said, um, you know, we talked about your privilege and we, talk, we, we talked about these kind of things. And Charles, they said that what Charles would say is, look, if you look at the history of Prince of Wales, they generally tend to be whoring, gambling, drinking, layabout, gadfly, fools. I've spent a huge amount of my time and energy um, doing charitable, unglamorous charitable work that nobody really cares about. One of the things that uh, I found very interesting about Charles was when Enoch Powell makes the Rivers of Blood speech, um, there's a line in a, in a letter or a diary or something that Dimbleby quotes where Charles says, I fear this will get worse before it gets better. The kind of tension within society uh, that, that Powell created. I think a lot of his work has been about trying to harmonize society and trying to stitch it together through charitable enterprises, through sort of NGOs. We'll never get to Romania. You know, we had an industrial revolution. We'll never be Transylvania. And I think he's probably quite sad about that. But he really has quite an apocalyptic worldview where he thinks things can go seriously badly wrong. And he thinks his job is to stop that from happening. There are not many Prince of Wales who, he's, you know, take him at his work. There aren't many Prince of Wales who have done that. I think it's sort of admirable if we don't have to accept the premise that monarchy is rational or good, you know, therefore. But, um, yeah. So you say we'll never be Transylvania. Mm. He'd quite like us to be. But then at the end of the piece, you having spent some time there and having driven around the area, seem to come to the conclusion that even this perfect part of Transylvania is in fact not as perfect as he might seem. You describe it as a feudal Disneyland. What what do you mean by that? And what do you think he has misunderstood about this place that clearly means so much to him? Well, change is constant. And so there is no static... There is no static... Um, possibility in, v in Viscri. So what's happened because of Charles's involvement there is that, yes, they have taught people how to make ceramic tiles to roof their houses with. Yes, they have uh, taught people how to thatch cottages. Or... He paid for their, their reed eco sewage system. Two million pounds. He just did it, didn't ask for anything, just, just Could he do it. that for the UK sewage system? <laughs> I think we could do with it. Um, Charles, if you're listening, um, please help us. Um, but because of his interests there, and because he kept going there, the world started to follow him. People, tourists started to follow him. And, and it has changed the character of Viscri. It's not what it was when he first found it. The buildings are going to be okay. The people who are very key to this, those, and, and this is a word that Romanians would use, those peasants in the field, they're increasingly not in the fields. They have four by fours. They have satellite dishes. They want to come to Britain or they already have gone to Britain. Um, and they send remittances back to other areas in Romania. And that money changes the character, the historic character of these villages. So you go and see big, concrete, four-story sort of McMansions in northern Transylvania. And this is like completely different to Charles's vision for this place. And I thought there was a real pathos in that. It wasn't, I'm not saying it was all down to him. Things change anyway. But his attention to that place has brought people there. So um, they have tried to build a car park there because cars keep showing up in the village, especially in the summer months when the flower meadows are in bloom and it really is immensely beautiful there. Um, they have a huge number of tourists. I was told that his last visit there was a bit of a disaster. So many people, so many cars, TV crews. Um, and so there's a bit of a tragedy there. Or you could say, well, you know, it's progress. It's progress. But Charles would not like the word progress. It's a bad word. <laughs> that is a fascinating insight about our new king and his mindset and attitude to our country. And uh, it also sounds like an absolutely 
gorgeous place that I would really like to go to. Although that would, as you say, possibly contribute to I'm harming sorry the for character. Dis- yeah, I'm sorry for destroying rural Transylvania. It is really lovely. Well, thank you so much for writing the piece and thank you for talking. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks so much for watching. Tell us what you think by leaving a comment below and you can watch more New Statesman videos by clicking the ones on your screen right now. You can also click to subscribe to make sure that you never miss a New Statesman video.